So I'll continue from where um, China left off and give examples of materials, in my case, a specific class of materials. And I'm going to pivot uh, towards uh, uh, also on biomedical and wearable health uh, um, for mobile health and to address uh, infectious diseases. So I walk, um, oh, let me say something. Uh, of course, for the sake of time, I won't go into a lot of details, but uh, you're welcome to also um, email me or talk to me after this uh, uh, session. So I walk in the class of materials known as two-dimensional materials, this uh, uh, atomically thin materials. Um, so the most popular of this uh, family is the graphite system. Uh, the graphite system is an atomic uh, equivalent of a stack of paper. And so just like a stack of paper, you can peel one sheet from the stack uh, in this graphite system, which is just carbon atoms in an hexagonal uh, fashion, uh, you can peel a layer of carbon atoms from the stack. And then this layer is what is known as graphene. And the physics behind this material led to the Nobel Prize in 2010. And today there are thousands of these layered materials that have different functions from piezoelectric, semiconductor, topological materials, semi-metals, uh, uh, sensor materials, energy materials. So any application, you could probably imagine these materials some member of these materials has the properties to address those functions. So what are some of the commodity applications of this? So in fact, we're all familiar with this uh, uh, materials. You may not know them as 2D materials, but uh, the most popular is of course uh, pencils. Uh, then you have hexagonal brown nitride is used heavily in the makeup industry. MOS2, another material is used as lubricants in uh, vehicles. The one property that makes these materials uh, Universal for this application is because they have this, they're solid lubricants because they're very anisotropic. So it's easy for material to flake off from the parent uh, crystal. Nowadays, in the last 15 years, we've been very interested in uh, uh, using these materials for more modern technology. So there's a renaissance, uh, so to speak, in this material science of these materials for new applications. So in my group, we do very multidisciplinary work. We grow these materials uh, in my lab, just like many other of my esteemed colleagues. Uh, then when we grow these materials, I often have students from material science, chemical engineering, uh, chemistry sometimes. And then we make devices from this. This could be electronic devices, sensor devices, optical devices. We've also done energy devices. And then from time to time, we see phenomena, new phenomena Then we throw off our engineering hat and put on our scientific hat. And then we do scientific research to understand this phenomena. So in this uh, uh, time, I'm going to focus on one aspect of our research, which is really on, I would say, the biomedical side of things, even though I am not a biomedical engineer. So the basic idea is this material, especially graphene, is the ideal materials for biosensors. And the reason for that is because they have this property known as very high surface to volume ratio. Basically, all the atoms are at the surface of the material. So each of these atoms, carbon atoms, can interact with the environment and give you very, very, very high sensitivity, which you may not get with other materials. So during the pandemic, then, uh, it became a call for material science everywhere to use their knowledge to advance solutions for pandemic uh, 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 technology. So one area that we have been able to contribute is in diagnostic sensing. So actually, uh, I've never done any biosensor before, but uh, what happened is in 2018, I went to Nigeria to give a talk at Covenant University and, you know, a bilateral collaboration began. And so one of the PhD students came to spend uh, six months in my lab and uh, she wanted to do biosensors for pediatric care, basically to monitor iron deficiency. So I told her, look, I am not an expert on this. She's like, oh, don't worry. I have studied everything theoretically. I just need access to graphene. I said, okay, I, you know, I have expertise in graphene. So she said, okay, it's not a big deal to make a biosensor. So this is, I think Dalal was mentioning this earlier, this bi-directional learning. So I actually learned a bit. She said, okay, to make a biosensor, the general architecture is like this. First of all, this materials, uh, it's very difficult to, to force them to interact with the environment. 
So to make them interact, you have to put these linker molecules uh, that are non-covalently bonded. And then once you put these linker molecules, then you can put an antibody. So the materials that we work with graphene are sensitive to everything. So for any application, you want to make them selective to only one thing. So these antibodies, in the case of viruses, these are produced by the body. Uh, these antibodies then provide you the selectivity to the virus or bacteria of interest. So she developed all of this for uh, 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 iron deficiency. And during the pandemic, in the beginning, we were able to deploy the same scheme for COVID uh, 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 virus. And the main thing is we just changed the antibody from um, ion-based antibodies to something that was going to be selective to uh, the viral particles. So the basic schematic is like this. Uh, they say a picture speaks a thousand words, a video probably says a million. So you have your big uh, giant COVID protein. This is, the, uh, this is the antibody, this is the antigen. And then when they interact, the purpose of the antibody within the body is to localize, identify this uh, uh, viral particle. So when they interact, then the electrical current in the graphene changes and we can monitor that change of current as an indicator of the presence of the virus. So the NSF were able to, were happy to support us because we developed a platform that was multi-viral uh, uh, sensor platform. So we can just change the antibody. It can be sensitive to COVID, it can be sensitive to flu, and you, any variant of the virus can be uh, 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 diagnosed like this. So now we've, uh, co we're commercializing this. My postdoc said, okay, uh, he feels that this is enough uh, 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 progress to move towards translation. So we're making prototypes now. This is all portable, uh, uh, um, kind of rapid testing technologies. So I'll just show one slide on data so we can, you know, I won't spend too much time explaining this, but we can monitor, but we can both uh, monitor COVID viruses and flu viruses in the same platform. You do derivative, uh, derivative analysis of the current versus time, so-called time series. You can readily identify the uh, occurrence of a COVID uh, uh, um, particle compared to uh, a flu or any other variant. And then in sensor technology, uh, especially for uh, mass testing, uh, we talk about two parameters. One is the limit of detection and the other is the response time. Obviously you want the limit of detection to be a single atom, you want the response time to be essentially zero seconds. So in this case, there are many technologies, many of them are being commercialized to help address pandemic challenges. So if you have a limit of detection around 10 to the minus 12, that's suitable for nasal sample. Nasal, you have a very high, relatively high concentration of COVID if you have COVID. However, uh, you know also saliva is becoming, uh, saliva testing is becoming a very popular platform. For that, it's a much more dilute environment, so you need a more sensitive uh, technology. So what we are doing now is actually achieving the limit of detection so we can walk directly with breath. So breath is extremely dilute. So that means your sensor, in order to avoid a lot of false negative, your sensor has to be extremely sensitive. So we've been able to quantify our sensitivity. Response time is in the second uh, uh, time frame. So we're delighted to move forward with this. Of course, from a business point of view, uh, the company is also pivoted into other emerging uh, uh, endemic uh, threats using this same platform. So the second example I'll give is on wearable health and technology. Um, and so the way I like to explain this is I'm actually, besides being a material scientist, I'm also an electrical engineer. So I like to think of the body as an electrical machine. So basically what that means is if you probe any point on the body, you can monitor and measure electrical signals, voltages and currents. And these electrical signals uh, have been known in physiology to correlate with the physical health of the person. Uh, so if you put this uh, uh, cables on the head of the person, you can measure the so-called EEG, and that has been known to correlate to seizures, for example, to mental health. You can place these cables on the chest area, then that measures so-called ECG, which is correlated with cardiac health. So any part of the body, you can measure the local health of that person. Of course, if you look at this, even though this has been a successful clinical technology for over 100 years, 
it's certainly not a mobile technology. Uh, so you cannot say mobile health. So there was a revolution uh, about 12 years ago by my very esteemed uh, super colleague, John Rogers, who was at Illinois, but now at Northwestern, uh, who realized that, look, uh, if the human body can be modeled as an electrical machine, you don't necessarily need all these big cables that need to be tethered to some machine. You could just have thin films of metal, and these thin films of metal can also measure all these electrical signals, and you may even be able to send the signal to some reader wirelessly. So that led to this uh, field, so-called electronic tattoo uh, 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 technology. And then for the last uh, uh, decade after this technology has been invented by John Rogers and colleagues, uh, the main, uh, part of the main research was making these metal films thinner and thinner. Because when you make, the metal film is very rigid. Metal are rigid compared to skin. So what happens is, when you place metal on skin, so epidermis is the outer layer of the skin and you have a thick film of metal, what you end up having is there's a lot of sliding. So, so because of the mismatch, it's like putting a, a, a plate on a rubber uh, 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 you know, uh, um, table. The plate is going to slide because there's a mechanical mismatch. So to reduce the sliding, you have to make this metal film thinner and thinner so that it can conform to the roughness of the skin. No matter how much makeup you wear, everybody's skin is rough, even a newborn baby. So, so that is guaranteed. So we need materials that would conform. So that's where graphene, being the thinnest material in the world in terms of uh, thickness, we realized uh, that if we could use graphene as a so-called electronic thin film tattoo, then it will perfectly match the roughness of the skin. You don't even need a tape to secure it. And then that led to the, you know, what we call the graphene tattoos. This is graphene tattoo on a model. It's transparent, it's imperceptible. That means you don't feel it because it's extremely light. And so the many applications enabled by this so-called epidermal or electronic tattoos, uh, human machine interface, I'll show an example of that, mobile health monitoring, athletic performance. So we're exploring many of these uh, uh, technologies. And in my lab, our goal is more holistic. So uh, uh, we make a lot of these electronic devices. So many times these signals that we measure from the body are of complex nature, uh, surrounded by a lot of noise. We're talking of big data. Uh, so we often have to use signal processing and machine learning algorithms. And then we contextualize the data. For example, if you have a very high heart rate uh, uh, during the day, that may not be a particular cause of concern, but if your heart rate is very high while you're asleep, then that is a cause of concern. So contextualizing the data then allows one to produce actionable data. When you produce enough of this data, it leads to this idea of so-called digital twin, which I won't talk about uh, today. When you do stuff that is new in the biomedical space, you always have to benchmark with what is already clinically accepted technologies. So this is just some measurements. Uh, ECG, as I mentioned, is the signal from the chest area. We can get similar signal to noise ratio as the existing standard. EMG is every time you move, move your muscles, there's signal. You can measure the skin temperature and hydration. Hydration is very important for athletic uh, uh, performance. You can also place this around the eyes and then uh, eyelids, and then you measure the so-called EOG. Every time you move your eyes, there's a signal. We can relate that to where exactly you're looking at and all of this. And then you can use that for, uh, for controlling a drone. So this is an example of a subject wearing the graphene tattoos on the eyelids. You don't see it because it's transparent. And then the movement of his eyes uh, are controlling this drone. There's a wireless transponder at the back of his head that sends the eye commands to the drone. And so we're not advocating that this could be a practical technology because the subject said he was very tired uh, from all this eye movements, but it's just an example uh, of gesture control. So I remember once we published this paper, we got correspondence, email request uh, 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 from the you know, US Army, from the UK military, the Israeli military. They wanted to know what is the uh, maturity of this technology. Anyway, uh, I'll spend the last example on a very important uh, uh, matter, and that is the area of vital signal monitoring. So in particular, we can measure all the vital signals. All of the vital signals you can get on your smartwatches today, except blood pressure. Blood pressure is the holy grail 
uh, of vital signal monitoring. And blood pressure is really uh, uh, the blood that is flowing from, being pumped from the heart, flowing through the arteries. And then this blood is exerting pressure on your arteries because your arteries are elastic. So the pressure of the blood on the arteries is what is known as blood pressure. Importantly, blood pressure is a leading uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, which blood pressure is a sign for, is the leading cause of death in the world. You know, you have 20 million people dying every year from uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, it's estimated that 90%, 90 of these deaths could be prevented. But unfortunately, it's not because cardiovascular diseases like hypertension are so-called silent killers. You don't, if you don't monitor them, you suddenly have them and then it could lead to a fatality. So there's a great need for blood pressure uh, monitoring technologies, especially that are mobile uh, rather than clinical. So this is a typical blood pressure wave. So when you go to the hospital, it doesn't matter which care you go for dentist, eye doctor, your normal physician, they're going to do a blood pressure measurement. They're going to tell you just the two top numbers, the maximum, the systolic pressure, and the minima, the diastolic pressure. And this is measured with this cuff, uh, this cuff technology, very successful clinical technology for over 120 years now is clearly not mobile. It's more stationary. So despite the many advantages that this cuff offers in monitoring blood pressure, it suffers severe disadvantages as well. It's very bulky, it's obtrusive. You cannot do this continuously. So oftentimes you want to be able to measure your blood pressure during sleep because your resting blood pressure says a lot about your health. Clearly you cannot go and sleep at the doctor's office. And even if you do, they're not gonna measure your blood pressure all night long because you won't be able to sleep. So there's need for technology that can do continuous monitoring. Then there's very serious issues known as white coat syndrome. That is when you go to the hospital and just the fact that you're in the hospital looking at a doctor wearing a white coat, you get anxiety. This anxiety leads your blood pressure to artificially increase. It doesn't mean you have hypertension. It just means you have this white coat syndrome. So for these reasons, uh, this has not been able to break away from the clinic where you have trained professionals. So we decided maybe our technology can be used to monitor blood pressure. So I have to say that uh, this collaboration, uh, I collaborate with Professor Ruzbe Jafari from Texas A&M. He's an expert on using artificial intelligence for biomedical uh, 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 signals. And so I, coming from the materials point of view, so we met for the first time, even though we're both based in Texas, at the U.S. Arab frontiers uh, in 2016. And then we went on the safari and you know, did a lot of social events. And then that established this collaboration that has now led to many publications. So I must again, thank Dalal for this wonderful opportunity to meet uh, great colleagues. So we said, okay, we can put these tattoos on the skin. And since we know that these tattoos are electrically conductive and the main uh, idea is blood is an electrical material. It's a medium, you can think of it as a cable. So when the blood pressure is, you know, when the arteries are being pushed out, it's like you have a fatter cable, a bigger cable. So the conductivity of the cable is higher. When the blood pressure is on the low cycle, that means it, the arteries are contracting, uh, uh, the electrical conductivity is also reducing. So by measure the electrical resistance, or we call this impedance, it correlates very well with the blood pressure. So this is blood pressure recording the full wave and then the same, in the same cycle we're measuring, in this case, the bioimpedance, it correlates very well. And then you can say, can we quantify this? So there are a couple of equations, but these equations are not good enough to get um, what we call clinically accurate quantitative blood pressure. So to do clinically accurate quantitative blood pressure, uh, so we have to uh, use, uh, this is where Roosevelt Jafari's expertise comes into play. Uh, we use a lot of machine learning uh, algorithms where we extract a lot of features from the blood pressure. We, so we have a lot of data, you know, a lot of training data from many subjects. And so at the end of the training, uh, we're able to get the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So these are experimental measurements taken from uh, volunteers uh, for this study. 
Uh, and then uh, there's an IEEE standard on uh, mobile blood pressure reading so we can achieve the highest level of accuracy. And importantly, this technology can do so-called bit-to-bit quantitative blood pressure recordings with clinical accuracy. So we're very excited about that. So that's just another example where we're using materials for advancing technology. In fact, there are many, many opportunities of putting these materials on different parts of the body, not only for biophysical measurements, which I talked about, but there's a lot of progress on biochemical measurements. Then there's also invasive applications in which we're doing some with clinicians. I won't talk about that data now. And then we see a future in which uh, we talk about meta, meta, metaverse, right? Uh, most of the people in this world do not have access to medical care. Most of them do not have access to a medical doctor. The metaverse has the potential to bridge this great divide and provide people access to care. Many of the people that don't have access to medical care, medical doctors have access to the internet. They all, most of them, not all, have access to smartphones. Um, so with the metaverse, there's an opportunity to connect this. So however, in order to make this vision a reality, if somebody that was in a remote location wanted to see a doctor, the doctor right now in telemedicine, the doctor can only give generic advice. Okay, how are you feeling? And then based on what you describe, they can give some idea. But what is needed is technology on the body, on the skin that can be streamed through the metaverse so the doctor can see your real time medical situation. So the vital signs, the blood pressure, the oxygen level, your temperature, and then taking that data, they can actually give you an accurate diagnosis of your situation and recommend the proper care. So uh, actually Meta approached us, uh, uh, you know, previously known as Facebook. So we, we're in discussions now to uh, advance these technologies for Metaverse. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you all for your time.